Global Extremes Update is brought to you by the all-new Toyota 4Runner. News from Everest for Saturday, May 17th. Common courtesy and proper etiquette dictate that hosts of anniversary celebrations welcome their guests with warm wishes and gracious affection. Apparently, Mount Everest forgot to read up on these social niceties in this, the 50th year of her inaugural summiting. The upper camps along her buttresses have been ravaged for days by never-ending gales. Equipment has been thrown across glaciers and into crevasses. When Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay sought the summit 50 years ago, they had natural obstacles, such as a menacing chimney that was later to be called the Hillary Step. For our Global Extremes climbers, their next physical obstacle will be on Monday, when they leave the security of Advanced Base Camp and face the 1,700-foot headwall that leads to Camp 1 on the North Pole. Reporting from Everest, I'm Craig Hummer. The Global Extremes team is poised for the summit. After challenging each other around the globe, our four climbers now must work as a team in an effort to tackle a mountain often unwilling to yield her secrets. For over 150 years, Everest has been known as the highest place on Earth. And as we get set to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first successful summit, we are preparing for later this week a historic television first, complete summit day coverage. Global Extremes Mount Everest, forerunners of adventure, has reached its culmination. It's nearly time to see who will stand on top of the world. It began in Moab, rock, river, and sand. Next, Aspen's cold and altitude. Then, the Kalahari's scorching sun, followed by Costa Rica's heat and humidity. Finally, Iceland's rugged Arctic interior, all in an effort to make it here, Mount Everest. Early morning here at our base camp in Tibet, the sun's rays touching the north side of Everest and the rooftop of the world. Hi everybody, welcome to Global Extremes. I'm your host, Craig Hummer, and we are at our OLN base camp studio sitting at 17,000 feet above sea level at the foot of the Rongbuk Glacier. Now the weather may seem picture perfect today, but it has been the weather that has crippled our team's efforts for weeks. Joining me throughout my time here is my co-host, world-renowned climber, Conrad Anker. And Conrad, we are 13 miles away from Everest, as you can see over our shoulders. And at this altitude, looks can be deceiving. The peak to the left is not what it seems. The small peak we see in the background there is Chung Tsen. It's about 21,000 feet, still 8,000 feet shy of the summit of Mount Everest. Now here at our base camp, it's beginning to at least look like a ghost town. It certainly is. Our climbers left last Wednesday for advanced base camp at an elevation of 21,000 feet. Just yesterday, they climbed to the North Pole. They still have two camps to go and 6,000 feet of climbing to make it to the top of the world. Well, with all this action and commotion, it looks like our summit day is going to be Thursday, May 22nd, starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, only on OLN. Now, for more of what's happening on the mountain, let's join the third member of our broadcast team. That's Peter Whitaker. So what's tent life like at 23,000 feet? Well, here's a few things that are important to me. First of all, an insulated pad that's plenty thick. I want as much padding between the snow and my body as possible. Next is a good warm sleeping bag. This mountain hardware is rated to 40 below. If they made one rated to 50 below, I'd be in it. Pockets. Look at this tent. Almost everything's on the floor, but with these pockets, you can get stuff off the floor, get much more organized. Some personal favorites of mine, a CD player, gotta have a good book, pictures of my family. Oh, and this one is really important. When the wind kicks up, earplugs for when the tent's rattling or if your tent partner's snoring. While we're on tent partners, my suggestion is to look for someone that's mentally stimulating and visually pleasant. Oh, hey, Pete. Hey, <laughs> Colleen, how's it going? Good. Back to you, Conrad and Craig. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Well, throughout today's telecast and our Summit Day coverage, we'll be taking breaks from here on Everest and throw it to our Connecticut studios. Let's go there now and join Everest veteran Pete Athens and Kirsten Gum. 
All right, thank you, Craig, and good evening to you from OLN's home base. I'm Kirsten Gum. Pleased to be joining you again as we move ever closer to a Global Extremes Summit attempt on Mount Everest. And joining me once again here in the studio is veteran Everest mountaineer Pete Athens. Pete, thanks for joining me once again. It's great to be back. Kirsten. Nice to have you here. Now we're only a few days away from a summit attempt. I'm sure this brings back a lot of fond memories for you. Oh, so many memories. It's, this is the most exciting time, really, for an expedition. This is months of preparation months of anxiety, uh, just so much work going into these last few days, and, and there's a high degree of enthusiasm and energy. All right, give me the truth here. What's going through your mind these past couple of days? Oh, any, any of the climbers out there, they're trying to just rigorously test their, their systems, their down system for when they're up high, their oxygen equipment, but as importantly, they're, they're questioning themselves, and they're trying to find that place inside of them that says, believe in yourself, you can get to the top of this. It's clearly been a long process to get to this place. Take me through some of the initial exercises the team will go through. Oh, there's so many logistical phases of an expedition. It's getting acclimatized, making sure you're healthy, making sure your equipment is up to, up to par, getting your ropes in place, just and countless details, a mountain of details. And it's it's really, really uh, important to have everything in place. Absolutely. Preparation is key there. It's a mountain of details, and that must be first taken care of before All right, thank you can you, get Pete. on top. Well, for the Global Extremes team, it has been a two long months already up on the mountain. Now, their preparation began with a trek to advance base camp and some early climbing to begin their adaptation on the mountain. Pete takes us through the, their long journey to Summit Day. Here's a look. It feels really good to be out hiking and, uh, Feeling pretty good, no headache. Um, just slow and steady today. It's nice to not be racing anymore. We can leave that behind for a while, maybe forever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, everything's going good. These initial forays on the mountain provide the climbers, as well as climbing guide Chris Warner, an ideal look at the team's strengths and weaknesses. For the Global Extremes team, it was an eye-opener. Record for me, just to get up here. Uh, as a group, everyone's been moving pretty well. And apparently we're making great time. from the North Call. It's kind of deceiving. You think 300 feet <laughs> and at sea level, that'd be nothing. But uh, here, it's that one step after another. The persistence of it, I think, is just focusing. And um, through Africa and Iceland and Costa Rica, we've had plenty of challenges, but I, this, is, this is unique. And yes, I think on a whole, mentally, physically, and spiritually, it's the most challenging thing I've done. And especially looking forward to what we have to do, which is um, go for the summit. Um, it's exciting, and I'm, I'm ready for it. I don't feel like I have a lot of reserve, but I do feel like I can always take that extra step. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> I don't know. You know, we're just five average, ordinary people that got selected to do this, right? <laughs> no. This is great. This is uh, pretty thrilling. Um, we're definitely thinking it through and using our common sense and... Um, we're having a good day. I think everybody feels comfortable with what we're doing, so it's good. Jesse's a powerhouse, as you can see. Sitting a blistering pace for the rest of us. The man has no pity for old people, like myself. When he's 38 years old, I'm going to go to his house and stomp on him. It's a hard day getting to the coal. And we've been traveling since 9.15 which makes it three hours and 30 minutes we've been going. And I gotta tell you, that's a really good time. Typically we tell people they can't make it to the coal in five hours, they're off the trip. <laughs> Everyone's gonna make it in under four. Here I am, so far, one step at a time, you know? It's like wheeling that next foot in front of the other one. That uh, seems to work so far. Keep on breathing. What's the elevation here? 7,000 meters, um, 22,000, 23,000 feet. 23. 23, right? Yeah. 
So at 23,000 feet, I'm getting a reading of 56% and a heart rate of 94. So, yeah. That's where we thought we'd be, about 50%. <laughs> Now it's down to 50, 49, great. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. What you should be focusing on now is not, in fact, the stove, but up put my new down suit. It's going to be a hit up here. It's all already. It's like a sleeping bag wrapped around me. You just you wasted no time in jumping into that down suit. No. <laughs> hey, we should spread the word. Everyone should do it. Try on your suits. They're great. I was just telling Colleen that I'm so glad there's another woman yeah. <laughs> here that we can share. Um, I was like, intimate spaces. Yeah, and I was actually looking forward to it tonight just because it's going to sound really strange, but it's not, it's going to be nice to share a tent with somebody and be able to chat and just debrief a little bit. We've been in such tight, tight quarters with everybody that it's hard to really have the chance to chat openly with somebody, so it's sweet. And at the same time, we're all, you know, these group of people, however many people, in this tight quarters, but it's still kind of this lonely space because we all just retire to our tents and hibernate and wait. And it's kind of an odd um, space, so yeah. it's nice to uh, vent and just cozy down here in the tent. And, uh, we're going to have an early dinner, and then we're just going to hunker down with some snacks. <laughs> and, we both bought a book. <laughs> we can see Camp 2 from here, so it's a little intimidating, but um, <laughs> it's, it's been a beautiful day. It's okay. incredible. And remember, our projected summit day is this Thursday, May 22nd. Coverage beginning at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Everest dominating the morning skyline here in Tibet. You can see the plumes coming off the famous Northeast Ridge, an incredible view of the world's highest mountain. Welcome back to Global Extremes, everybody. Conrad, we have been here for over a month, our climbers for over two months. Now, they did spend close to three weeks down here at base camp. How is that going to affect their acclimatization up at the higher elevations? Prior to that time at base camp, they made a reach up to 25,000 feet. It would have been good to get to 27,000 feet, but the storms forced them back down. The time spent at 17,000 feet, though, has been very beneficial as the body can recuperate to a certain degree. All right, well, more from Everest in a moment. Let's throw it once again back to our studios in Connecticut. All right, thank you guys very much. Craig Hummer and Conrad Anker trying to stay warm at base camp. Now, once again, a reminder that we're anticipating a summit push to happen this Thursday, May 22nd. Our Global Extreme team continued their early acclimatization on the mountain. After the North Call, it was time to move even higher. Pete Athens takes us through the next phase. Camp 2 looms above. Although the climbers can see it clearly, its distance is exemplified by its altitude at 24,610 feet. The route from the North Call to Camp 2 involves an elevation gain of over 3,500 feet. The weather continues to favor the group, so their greatest challenge remains finding the energy from within to carry on. As they continue upward, not only does their strength decrease, but so does the size of their camps and amenities. Chris remains impressed with his team's performance. Well, everyone uh, is willing to admit that the climb from the North Pole to Camp 2 is the worst hike they've ever had. But people are learning the difference between being an endurance athlete and being a mountaineer. And uh, Colleen had a breakthrough day today. She was probably the last to leave and the first to arrive at Camp 2. Over. It's just nice to just lay here in the heat. Relax. You warm in there? Yeah, in my whole puffy suit. With the dawning of a new day comes the additional challenge as the group continues their push up towards the next camp. The most critical part of, part of today is that we're going to be climbing on rock. And up until this point, we've been climbing on snow. And uh, the last 5,000 vertical feet of Everest really is a rock climb. And it's critical that these guys are able to climb on this rock up and over little boulders and stuff with their crampons on. And let me tell you, it's not easy at sea level. It's even going to be harder at 25,000 to 26,000, almost, well, 26,000 feet is about as high we'll get today. We spent the night at Camp 2, and we're trying to go up maybe an hour or so on the rock and things, and um, we've just come up like 10 minutes, but uh, my hands are, are really, really cold, and uh, it's making me feel a little unsafe, so seeing as though this isn't the summit push, and it's not necessarily one of those days, I uh, 
I just feel a little unprepared. Maybe I should have different visions, and you know, I haven't been here before, so <laughs> I uh, need a little more insight. So today, at this moment, I'm deciding to turn around and head down, and I feel comfortable with that. I just, I just think safety's um, safety's first right now, and my hands are freezing. I've set up my um, descender, and I'm gonna head down and get my pack, get in the sun, and head down to North Call and just get a get my wits about me and and it sounds like by tomorrow we'll be at base camp and I'll just take it all in and know what I need to do next time. Climbers must constantly find a balance between pushing themselves physically and making tough mental decisions regarding safety. Strength and agility can quickly be overcome by weakness and fear. As the summit bid looms, this process will become even more critical. All right, thanks, Pete. Do you have questions for Pete Athens? Well, later in the show, we'll be taking your calls live on the air. The number to call is 1-866-OLNEXEV, or you can email us at globalextremes at OLNTV.com. Back in a moment. Ace Camp Studio, Craig Hummer along with Conrad Anchor. It is May 19th, and Mount Everest, also known as Chumalungma, has yet to be summited. Now, this is very late in the season for no one to have yet stood on top of the world. The reason? The high winds that have ravaged the upper mountain. Now, it has decimated camp after camp, Conrad, and crippled numerous expeditions. A large low pressure in the Bay of Bengal has pulled the subtropical jet stream down onto Everest. These extreme winds have precluded any form of climbing. It's rare that climbers haven't made it to the top of Everest by the 19th. The last time this happened was 1986. We do have breaking news, though. It looks like four climbers are going to the top on the Northeast Ridge today. The winds did subside long enough for our climbers to leave base camp. Let's check in with Peter Whitaker, who welcomed the global extremists to advanced base camp at 21,000 feet. Welcome, buddy. Thanks. Good walk up. Oh, this is nice. Hey, good. Felt good to finally do something. I was going to say, two weeks of hanging around down there. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, felt good. Cool. Well, things uh, were torn apart, and then we put them back together, so yeah. hopefully, hopefully it looks pretty much the same. It looks surprisingly good. Uh, I didn't think it would look this good. <laughs> nope. it's, uh, it's set and ready for you guys to move in. We're ready to move in. Go for it. Grab your tent, drop your pack. All righty. <laughs> Here we are, closer to Chomolungma. Woo! <laughs> The rest of my, my good, legs. <laughs> good to be out of base. Yeah. Be hug without a pack. Uh, Missed you. Yeah. You having some fun up here, huh? A little bit. A little, little bit. bit of wind. Everything's rearranged. Hi. Good to see you. All these smiles. Love it. I got tea along the way. These guys rock. Here, sit, 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 sit. <laughs> so camp has been blown apart and then put back together. I was just wondering where my stuff is, but I'm sure I'll find it. We'll get to it. Where were you before? In front of that. Um, yep. yeah, the ones on the, the left. Flag. In front of the, the big rock. Yeah, with the flags right there. There was yeah. Chris and me. Those, like four tents went. Green. Poof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but we uh, got the tents and got most of the gear, yeah, so sure. we'll scramble. I'm not worried about it. Here I am, healthy, alive. Whew. You come from below. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Oh, it was good. Pretty mellow for me. Yeah. Talked to folks, had a little tea, ate, drank. Took your time? Took my time, yeah. Has that walk from base camp to ABC gotten any shorter? No. <laughs> Feels a little better this time, but I was having fascinations about someone on the summit saying, hey, I got a tandem paraglider. Why don't we just, and I need an extra passenger. We could just fly down that's a good at the thought. finish, you but I don't think that's going to happen. You probably want to make sure he was a pretty good pilot, though, huh? Yeah, it would be tempting. <laughs> it would be tempting. It, it was great today. It was, uh, I mean, it's long no matter how you slice it. Yep. But it felt, you know, it was night and day compared to the first time. And uh, the leisurely pace, sailing in here at 3.30, just still got the sun, just some time to put some extra clothes on. It's good. It's got a different feeling to it, you know? It's it's like uh, more purposeful than the first time. It's yep. got an energy that's more like, this is actually part of the climb. 
the weather's actually shaping up nicely. <clears throat> Yesterday we all went up to the call. A bunch of Sherpas, a uh, bunch of team members carried a lot of gear up. And there's a weather window that's shaping up. It looks like 20th, 21st, 22nd. It's really to hear. All right, I'm going to unpack, see if I got any rocks in my bag. Okay. And uh, maybe grab something to eat. It's good to be here, Pete. Yep, good, right on. It's time for us to step aside once again and send it to the Connecticut studios. All right, thank you, Craig. Man, it's great to see our finalists in good spirits at Advanced Base Camp. Of course, we'll check back in with all four of our Global Extremes climbers a bit later in the show. Man, Pete, what do you say? They seem all jacked up, a lot of smiles. No, it's one of the most important things, just maintaining your enthusiasm, obviously under, under a lot of duress, um, a lot of anxiety about how they're going to do above. I'm, I'm really encouraged. They look great. Now, should our athletes by any means be worried because no one has made it up to the summit yet this year? That concerns me. Well, it definitely would concern me, but knowing that this time of year, oftentimes it's very windy there, um, and you can never completely anticipate when it's going to drop, but things look favorable for the team, and they're approaching the mountain with humility, and I think they'll, they'll be rewarded. And I guess you just have to keep your mind in the right place at all times. Absolutely, and one has to be patient. Very patient. Patience is a virtue, they always say, In right? In this case, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, if you've got questions for Pete, he is here and he's waiting for your call. You can reach us at 1-866-OLNEXEV. Again, that is 1-866-656-3938. Or you can email your questions to us. The address, globalextremes at olntv.com. Either way will work. In just a moment, we will be back with more from Mount Everest right after this. Stay with us. Global Extremes Mount Everest, presented by the all-new Toyota 4Runner. Larger, more powerful, more capable. And brought to you in part by Subway. Fresh-made sandwiches on fresh-baked bread. Subway. Eat fresh. And by Rolling Rock Beer. Grab a rock. Welcome back to Global Extremes Mount Everest. Despite the sunshine, looks can be deceiving. It is well below freezing here. The hat, the jacket, they are not just props. Now, we've had a lot of inquiries as to how we're pulling this all together on the mountain. It hasn't been easy, but to show you just how we're doing it, we've put together a little tour of the facilities. Nothing is easy at 17,000 feet. It's hard enough to breathe let alone work, not to mention put together a live telecast. There's a lot of technology that goes into making this all happen, and it all starts right here with these eight generators. They power everything and make it all possible. Here at the RF, or radio frequency tent, the needs for power are immense. This is where we connect to the outside world. Phones, computers, internet, transmit and receive equipment, it's all here. But the main function of this area is to relay information from the mountain back to the U.S. Our summiting cameramen transmit directly to these receivers, giving us up-to-the-minute photos of the climb as it happens. At the North Pole, however, it is obscured by part of the mountain. So we've put a reflector there with our reporter, Peter Whitaker. We're at 23,000 feet, you guys at base camp. About, what, 6,000 feet higher than you. Air's a little bit thin. We're trying to get our technology together. This is Dave over here. Dave, say hello. Hey, guys. We've got a little satellite dish. We're trying to bounce the signal up to about 26,000 feet on the north face of Everest. That'll then head on down to base camp and get bounced from there back to the States. Russell Bryce, expedition leader's inside, getting our radio communications all set up. I don't know a thing about this stuff. But these guys do. We've got a lot of work in the next couple days to try and get all our technology up and in place before our climbers go for the summit. But with a little luck and hopefully a little good weather, we'll get it all in place as they head for the top. Back to you at base camp. Thanks, Peter. It's no easy task to get gear up the mountain. There are no roads, so climbing Sherpa provide a vital link to the higher camps. Now let's join my co-host, Conrad Anker, for a critique on Tibetan craftsmanship. Thanks, Craig. As you can see here, the Tibetans are really handy with rock. 
They've been building houses and corrals for centuries, and they've built two studio desks for us, one inside and one outside, and I find it quite appropriate for our Everest coverage that our desks are made out of rock. I'd give this handiwork a 10 out of 10. So everything we've already seen leads here to the nerve center, the control room. More buttons, knobs, dials, and gizmos than you can count. Frankly, it's all Greek to me, but somebody knows how to put it all together and then to push the on button. Seriously, all this gear had to be planned out, ordered, shipped, and then prepared and put together, all in an effort to bring you the first televised complete summit attempt. How do these pictures get to you? Through this rather inconspicuous satellite dish, which beams it to Hong Kong, then it's fiber optically transmitted to Hollywood, to Atlanta, with one final stop in Connecticut before it reaches your living room. Reporting from Base Camp, I'm Craig Hummer. Hey, I wonder what this button does. Oops. Just kidding, that's our attempt at high altitude humor. If our forecasts hold true, our summit day is Thursday, May 22nd at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Once again, let's send it back to the U.S. and the OLN studios in Connecticut. All right, guys, thanks very much for that report. Man, your set looks quite comfortable. I don't know what you're complaining about, Craig. Gosh. We are pleased to introduce a former competitor on Global Extremes, Captain Eric Kapitulik of the United States Marine Corps. Eric, thanks for being here once again. Oh, thanks for having me back. Now, when you applied to be a contestant on Global Extremes, I know you wanted the chance to summit Mount Everest, but I know you also use your muscles and your physical ability to actually raise money for a scholarship fund that you actually set up for fallen soldiers. Explain that a little bit for me. Right. Well, on December December 9th, 1999, my men and I were practicing for an upcoming deployment to the Persian Gulf, and unfortunately the helicopter that we were riding on uh, struck the side of a ship and entered the Pacific Ocean. Uh, of the 11 Force Recon Marines uh, under my command, six of them weren't as fortunate as I was to uh, swim out of the helicopter. So uh, after returning from deployment, I've raced in some Ironman triathlons as well as uh, global extreme type events trying to raise money for a college scholarship for their children. The one thing I'd always like to say though, Kristen, is that I get way too much credit for it. And if there's only anybody going to receive any credit, it should be the widows, their children, and my men who died. Well, you know, I have a little present for you here. Um, for all your contributions to OLN and all the hard work you've done over the past couple of months, we would like to give you a check for $5,000. From the OLN much. staff. Thank you for Thank all your you. contributions. This really is a, I don't know nobody at home actually <laughs> thinks I'm, I'm, I'm uh, probably think I'm joking, but this honestly is a surprise here. We actually didn't. Do this, so Pure really, surprise, I promise. Yeah, well, thank you. I really can't thank you enough. And, uh, you know, everybody, Roger and John and everybody, thank you so much. Eric Capitulic, really almost speechless. Yeah, really. I never that thought not, I would that say that. Well. Yeah, <laughs> sure my men are, yeah, my men are watching that. this going, I wish we should have done that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also good luck. I know you're training for the Ironman in Idaho. Thank you. You know, sit tight right now because uh, when we return, we're going to take your phone call. So hang on the line. That number again is 1-866-OLNEXEV. That is 1-866-656-3938. Of course, we're going to be back right after this. Stay with us. And welcome back to Global Extremes Mount Everest for Runners of Adventure. I'm Kirsten Gum, joined here in the studio by Pete Athens, who's a decorated mountaineer. You actually have seven summits to your credit. And I'm also joined here by ex uh, Global Extremes competitor Eric Kapitulik. And we're going to take some phone calls, but uh, this is live television. And yes, uh, we're having some troubles with our phone lines. So let's go ahead and go to some email questions. Sound good? Great. All Great. right. The first one is for you, Eric. And it says, Look ba looking back on your experience, uh, what would you have done differently? Well, uh, as I said throughout the show uh, while I was competing, that really my main goal was to make sure that I represented the Marine Corps, my family and friends, and myself the way it all deserves to be represented. And I think I did that, which I'm very happy to. After returning home and seeing a couple of the Kalahari shows, I think that I would try to climb over the fence rather than <laughs> jump over the fence because I have received way too much heat from my friends over that one little episode. <laughs> well, you know, 
It happens, right? Yeah, you unfortunately just, it happens to me though. So <laughs> you just tripped a little. Yeah. Let's go to another email question, Pete. This one is for you here. Right. If we can get it up on the screen a little bit. Um, what was the feeling in the community following the disaster of 1996? Well, I think the mountaineering community felt a, a fatal blow delivered in 1996. I mean, obviously two of our sport's greatest practitioners were were killed above 26,000 feet, very, very close to the summit of Everest for the sake of Rob Hall. And it was a, it was a terribly tragic time. It was one of those, those things that Rob Hall, we felt like, could have climbed Everest in his sleep and could have gotten up, up and down very easily. But unfortunately, he was in a situation where he had, he had clients who really wanted to get to the summit. And I think Rob was, was just feeling the pressure, the commercial pressure. And I think that he, he maybe buckled into to making some decisions he knew he shouldn't have made. Yeah, and it was a very unfortunate situation, too. Uh, Absolutely. Wish we never had to have any of that happen, but some good has come out of it. Some good has, but the world is, is less for those people being yeah, gone. That's true. Uh, the next email question is from Chris, and it is for Eric. It says, Eric, are you still interested in summoning Mount Everest? Are you going to do it? Yeah, sure, I will do it. I, uh, if there's anybody actually out there right now who uh, <laughs> is going and wants to pay my way, please, <laughs> I'll uh, be happy to. But no, I, I will summon Mount Everest. Uh, I'm going to Chicago Business School starting in the fall, and probably after business school when I can eat something other than baked potatoes and tuna fish, <laughs> uh, when I can afford something more than that, then I'll make my other attempt at Mount Everest. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I know that you will, you will summit. Yeah, I hope so. You have your way for sure. Our next email question is again for Pete. Pete, how has the climbing equipment changed over the years? Oh, climbing equipment has changed dramatically, especially in oxygenic systems. You know, when I first started going on Everest expeditions, it looked like we were I don't know, galvanizing an effort to go, to go out on the Calypso for deep sea diving. They look like scuba tanks and the gear was, you know, would weigh in excess of 45 pounds. And now the systems that people are currently using is less than about a dozen pounds. So oxygen equipment is really the chief improvement over the last several years. Wow. And that doesn't mean to mean that you don't have to be as strong as you were a couple of years ago, huh? Absolutely. It does not. Still requires it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, we are out of time, and uh, we will work on the phone calls. Uh, again, technical difficulties. We apologize for that. But uh, when we're back, we will be on the mountain with Craig and Conrad after this break. Again, uh, please be with us and try to give us a call. We're going to get those phone lines working for you. Hopefully, sometime soon, this is Mount Everest, the summit attempt. We'll be back. My name is Colleen Inkin. I'm from Alma, Colorado, and I want to climb Mount Everest because life truly is different at 29,000 feet, and I want to experience it. Global Extremes Climbers. Welcome back, Craig Hummer, along with Conrad Anchor. Now, Conrad, our four climbers worked their way around the globe to get here. Once they got here, they've had to work their way up the mountain. Now, they are close. How are they going to close this out and make that final push on summit day? The Global Extreme Climbing Team is arguably the strongest on the mountain. They've been training for six months and they are highly motivated. They also have a one-to-one -one climbing Sherpa ratio, which gives them the strength and the experience necessary to climb the mountain. The wild card, though, is the weather. It can change in a day, an afternoon, an hour. But if it didn't do this, it wouldn't be climbing, now would it? No, it would not. And as they approach summit day, let's hear some thoughts from our climbers. Uh, waiting at base camp uh, was longer than I anticipated, for sure. But uh, it definitely allowed me to get stronger. And I did some hikes around there and kind of just got into my space. And um, as the time neared for us to come up here, I was you know, able to just find a great rock off by myself and focus. And um, yeah, it was, a bit, it was a bit long, for sure. But I, I tried to use it wisely and just get in, in that um, space that's going to allow me to push hard up here. It was hard to motivate to climb. But I did, like, I got up to 20 twice just because I felt like I had to, you know. So coming back to here, I mean, walking from 17 to, what, 21.3 or something, I felt like I had to do a few hikes. So I tried to motivate to get up there. And hopefully 20 was good enough. And I'm going to hang out here for a day and get used to this again. If you put it on the days, this, this day counts, you know. It's almost like day one done, you know, of however many, five, seven, eight. And as much as, you know, you still have to stop and get your breath, and the pack still feels heavy, but it, it seems like, you know, here we are, try to take care of it, and then we'll be on our way. You know, I think we're as ready as we're going to be uh, 
I think it was, you know, today was a great day hiking uphill. We, you know, we feel like we're getting somewhere now. So I think we're all uh, pretty motivated to get up there, and I think everybody's feeling really good and got a strong group, so I'm real optimistic about it. This is an amazing place. It's magical. You know, it has been from the get-go, and the days are drawing near, and uh, it's just that, I think it's that reality that's coming upon us that you know, we're going for the push. And I have no idea what I'll be feeling if I make it to the summit of Mount Everest. Um, I'm sure it will be intense, and I'll be breathing deeply and trying to take in every moment every step, every feeling, every nuance of nature. That's what our climbers think. Now let's see what climbing leader Chris Warner has to say. He's with Peter Whitaker. Hey, Chris, you in there? Yeah, sure am, Pete. Come on up for a second. I wanted to ask you a question or two. Okay. If I'm not, you know, cramping your social <laughs> yeah, like, here. yeah, yeah. I'll check in with all the other hermits that are in this tent, <laughs> see what they're up to. Hey, just quickly, the team came up yesterday. They seemed to be pretty jazzed. Uh, Thoughts on their mental status, physical status? Yeah, I think actually yesterday was a great day for us because, you know, we've been sitting in base camp for over two weeks, almost 18 days. And, uh, you know, when you sit for a long time, you start to doubt whether you have any, like, gas left in your tank. And yesterday we came up here and we motored. I mean, we really moved fast. We hiked 13 miles, gained 4,200 vertical feet, and did all that between six and seven hours carrying a pack. So that was great. That's yeah, good. really good. And uh, thoughts on the summit? There's still some work that needs to be done up above. Yeah, you know, to, to, to get ready for the Summit of Everest, you have to put a lot of puzzle pieces together, and uh, they're not quite interlocking at this point. What's happened is, you know, we had this big storm that pushed us back. That's really what caused our delay in base camp, and during, since it was been a little bit better, we've been able to start to stock the North Coal again and get start to move stuff in position for the upper camps. But until the ropes are into the summit, which is really requires the efforts of not only our team, but all the other big teams that are here, getting to the top is going to be almost impossible. Right. You've been with a few groups up on the mountain. Uh, how's this group rate, do you think? Yeah, well, this is the third season that I've climbed Everest, or guided Everest, and uh, this is the strongest team I've been with. And just watching as we hike past other groups, as, you know, we're climbing up to North Cole and watching, you know, other groups in action, we really seem to be very, very strong, which cool. is great. Good confidence builder for us, you know, as the guides as well as, the, you know, the climbers. Excellent. Go back to your book. Good. Thanks. <laughs> See you yeah. guys. Chris Warner knows what it takes to get to the summit of Mount Everest. When we come back, more Global Extremes action, plus some final thoughts from our crew in Connecticut. Welcome back to our OLN Base Camp studio here at the foot of the Wrong Buck Glacier. Craig Hummer along with Conrad Anchor. Conrad, we are in the stretch run. This is Summit Week. You've been here before. How did you keep yourself focused and how did you get yourself psyched up to make that final push up the mountain with so many other people trying to do the same thing? By the time our climbers get in position to make the Summit of Everest, they will have been here for two months. Obviously, Everest isn't climbed in a day. I find the best way to stay motivated in between stocking camps and acclimatizing is to surround myself with happy, fun-loving people, share mutual energy, and then work on my equipment because that is, after all, my lifeline to safety. Let's find out how one of our Global Extremes climbers is dealing with life on the mountain. Petit Pinson is with Peter Whitaker. Hey, Craig, Conrad, we're on a rest day up here at ABC. What's that mean? Well, we thought we'd follow Petit around and find out. This is my bedroom, <laughs> right here. Uh, my two uh, nice foam pads provided by Russell Bryce and company. And my wonderful warm sleeping bag, Moonstone. I actually have a little liner that goes in there, keeps me nice and toasty at night. My down jacket is a pillow. Um, actually, today we've been trying to organize a bunch of food, what we might, may or may not take up on the climb with us, Colleen and I. So I uh, have a big bag of food here. My my drinks keep me keep me hydrated throughout the night. My books and my pens, my journal, my entertainment center right here. Entertainment center. When the wind is howling at night, sometimes I prefer to listen to my tunes. Um, this is a bag of um, good luck uh, sort of pieces from people back home, sentimental things that people um, gave me to give me strength and energy and safety and all those things. So that hangs right by my bed, by my head, and that keeps me 
keeps me going. Every night and every morning, I, I go to sleep and wake up to these wonderful people, my brother, Christian, and holy my niece, Liliana, my beautiful dog, Miles, my dad, Alan, and my brother, Anthony, my mom, Inga, with her dog, Winston, and my sister, Stephanie. Um, keeps me smiling and gives me tons of strength and energy every morning. Um, people who support me. I have my necessities over here. Well, you know, there are probably more than that. <laughs> uh, a little ibuprofen in case the headache comes, which isn't here this time, but a pie will, I'm sure it will be. You know, a little lotion, toothbrush, uh, vitamins, <laughs> more food, M&Ms, gotta have them. Um, things I'm anticipating wanting a pie, like a bunch of um, hard candies and cough drops to keep my throat going. Goo! Goo too low. <laughs> keep me hydrated when I'm up high. A little bit of calories. I guess um, we're thinking about losing a lot of weight while we're up there, so just thinking what I might um, be able to eat while I'm up there. You know, headlamp, sunglasses, all those, all those things that keep me, um, keep me going in my little, in my little home. <laughs> thanks for the visit. It's good. I'm going to take a nap now. <laughs> Our thanks to Petite Pinson and all the climbers for inviting us into their personal space on the mountain. Believe me, I know how hard it can be when cameras are following you around. Joining me once again is Pete Athens. Pete, was that a good representation of what life is like on the mountains? Because, you know, Petite is always happy. <laughs> She's always <laughs> no, smiling. It's perfect, you know. This, there's one of the few times when you really can allow yourself to let your guard down and, and to relax a little bit. And you have to create almost like a sanctuary inside your, your tent. And she had her photos on, on the wall of the tent. And it's really nice to have that. You can go inside there. You can be meditative, contemplative on what life is like at home. But really, just a scant few millimeters of fabric away is, is Mount Everest in the natural world. What do you do? How do you spend your time up there? Well, I'd go nuts. Yeah, for different people, they do different things. I, I personally like to do a, lot, do a lot of journal writing. I'll do photography. I'll, I'll write poetry. I'll read quite a bit. And then a lot of it is, is just, just to try to relax and garner energy for the coming days. All right. Well, we have heard from the climbers. Let's check in now with a very important person on the mountain. That is expedition leader Russell Bryce. Here's his assessment of the expedition. I was a little bit bummed today that we got set back with uh, no work up high because of the wind. Um, but it was the right call to, for the guys not to go up. Uh, we saw some shepherds go up and they turned around and came back. Um, but you know, it's about now that uh, things get exciting and uh, uh, you know, we got a good forecast on the 19th and um, looks like we're ready to roll and uh, all of a sudden uh, we're on the summit and then we go home. It's, uh, everything sort of speeds up at this last uh, quarter of the expedition. All right, that is Russell's take on the summit attempt for Thursday. We'll send it back up to Everest to wrap things up right after this. larger, more powerful, more capable. And brought to you by the United States Marine Corps. The change is forever. And by Moonstone Mountain Equipment, intelligently and creatively engineered to allow you to perform at peak levels. And by Expedia.com. Don't just travel, travel right. Will mighty Everest open up her arms to our climbers? We will soon find out. Welcome back to Global Extremes, Mount Everest, forerunners of adventure. Conrad, it's time to wrap up our second preview show. We are just days away from the summit push. Back in 99, what were your thoughts when you were this close to going for the summit? When I departed from my tent on the morning of May 17th, I was filled with trepidation as Mount Everest is a huge and intimidating mountain. Well, let me ask you, how did you balance that fear with the possible excitement of standing on top of the world? Being a good climber entails knowing what your limits are and not exceeding them, then also listening to fear, for fear is your self-preservation. Very wise words. Well, we hope you have enjoyed this well-rounded look into life on Everest. Our climbers are getting into position. Summit Day is almost upon us. Thursday, May 22nd, starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, our Global Extremes climbers will make their final push towards the top of the world. For daily reports until then, check out OLNTV.com and Yahoo.com slash Global Extremes. For Conrad Anchor, Peter Whitaker, and the whole Connecticut crew, I'm Craig Hummer. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody, for a television first. Good night. Thank you.